Well, good morning. It's great to see you all here as we worship the Lord together this morning. Uh, If you are here online, I invite you to say hello to others, say uh, where you're at, uh, interact with others online as well so that uh, you might create community online. Uh, For those who are here, this is our uh, in-person essential teams group, and it's great to see you here uh, on this Sunday morning. Uh, As we continue in our time of worship, just note that there are a few things going on. The first is that we are uh, in a season in which we are talking about the doorways of hope. As we uh, turn the corner from uh, where we were in the fall towards this Christmas season, uh, we're going to be focusing in this Advent season on hope. And so today we're going to be opening the first door of hope. As we see uh, this green garland, the, the wreath as well as the red ribbon, they are reminders for us of the upcoming hope that we have, the promises we have in God. And so I invite us to uh, consider those as we look forward to this time of hope together. A couple of things also to be aware of is that we are... Uh, using uh, rational thinking in terms of how we do uh, good worship safely together. And so using our agreed on strategies, we are uh, having remote online service uh, today. And uh, when the numbers come back down uh, below 15, we'll start doing in-person again. Uh, But we invite you to watch this at home, share with friends, uh, interact with it uh, online as well. And uh, just looking for that day in which we'll be able to meet in person together again for worship. Um, Also note that uh, we're coming up on the 31st anniversary of the memory tree out front. If you'd like to uh, light a bulb in memory of a loved one, uh, just send in uh, $5 to Jan Kinder. Let her know uh, who that bulb is for, and we'll make sure that that happens for you. Also note that uh, we are caring for our community in a couple of ways. Uh, The first is through Christ Care. A number of families with smaller children, we're providing uh, newly purchased uh, hats, scarves, gloves, boots, uh, those kinds of essential items. And uh, if you'd like like to be a part of that ministry, uh, I invite you to call uh, Elaine Koser. Her phone number is there on the screen in front of you and invite you to make that phone call. Also that we are collecting uh, warm items to give away and that uh, giveaway is going to be on December 4th from 10 to 1. And so uh, call, uh, I think we're contacting Chris Steves, Uh, give her a call, let her know that you're bringing by some items. I know she was saying if you want to drop off some items at the education building, uh, she'll come by to pick them up as well. Uh, Just maybe let her know that you're doing that so that they don't just blow away (laughs) in the wind. Now, also, the last thing to think about is looking ahead, uh, Christmas Eve service. This is going to be the 24th, of course, at 7 o'clock. And this will be a great celebration this year. Rather than having our Christmas concert, a lot of those music items are going to happen as part of our Christmas Eve service. And so uh, just come. It's going to be a good time. We are anticipating that the numbers will be low enough that we can actually gather in person. Uh, we'll let you know if that changes. Uh, but the idea is that we'll also be broadcast online, just like the service. And so we'll have a chance to enjoy that. That together. And so with that in mind, we recognize that uh, we are called together as his people and to pass the peace of Christ. Someone asked, why do we pass the peace of Christ? Uh, and part of that is to recognize that God invites us to experience his peace. And as we gather together as a church, we extend the peace of Christ to one another, uh, recognizing that God has reconciled us to himself. We are reconciled to each other. And so we pass that peace to one another. Uh, during this time, we're also using this as an opportunity to share uh, a question that we might share together during this passing the peace. And this question I'm asking is, what are you hoping for this next year? Uh, Maybe you have something you're anticipating, uh, maybe a child on the way, a grandchild, or uh, something happening in the next year. I invite you to to put that online, uh, to make comment about that. I know that in general, I think we're all hoping that COVID will be done. (laughs) We'll be able to get out of all of this in the next year. We definitely don't know. We thought it would start six weeks and only be five weeks, six weeks long and then be over, but it just keeps on going. So we're hoping that's going to be over. Are there any other hopes that you uh, have that you would want to put out there? All right. I invite you to put those comments online as we respond. And now I invite you to stand as we uh, gather for the opening prayer. Please join me in the opening prayer. O promise-keeping God, We seek your truth today. Open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our minds to understand, that we may come to know your ways and follow your paths. Prepare our hearts to receive the coming of the one who is the true source of our salvation. Help us to take hold of the promises that you have set before us as we look toward that day 
when you will fulfill the hope that you have given us in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I invite us to continue with a song. Today is um, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, hymn number 196. and family to come forward this time as we do the lighting of the Advent candles together. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judea. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judea will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord our righteous Savior. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our hope. God is a promise-keeping God, whose word endures forever. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen. I'm us to hear the scripture together. The scripture reading today is from Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God.
You may be seated. It's great to see all of you here, and for those of you who are joining us online, I'm glad to have your attendance with us. Uh, we are beginning in a new direction as we start Advent together, talking about the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Uh, several months ago, as we were starting the Purpose Driven Life, we recognized that uh, as the COVID numbers continue to go on and as we continue to press into what God is calling us to, uh, we recognize that we need to grab hold of hope. And so uh, Pauling and invited to go back to the camera here as we're thinking about hope together uh, and the hope that God calls us to as his people. And so as we, we talk about this first week, we let the first candle for Advent, uh, the candle of hope, and each of these weeks we're going to be unpacking one more of these doorways of hope. And this first doorway is recognizing that we have a promise keeping God. God is God who keeps promises. I'm not sure if you've ever thought of that as you look through Scripture, the ways that God keeps promises, the way that God continues to invite people into the promises that God makes. But it's an amazing thing if we were to read through Scripture, Scripture is almost continuously one story after the next of how God invites us into an experience of a promise that he is making. We think about Abraham, where God called Abraham out of the land where he was. He says, I promise that as you follow me, I will take you to the promised land. I will take you to a place where your family will flourish. Oh, and by the way, you and your wife who has been barren, even in her late years, she will bear a child. She will bear a son and, and you will have children as numerous as the stars. And of course, Abraham and Sarah at that moment had no children. They had very little to their name. And the question was, could they trust God as a God, pro promise keeping God? to fulfill what he has called them to. And as we look through scripture, we recognize that God continues to invite people into promise. Noah, right before the flood, says, if you trust me, if you live your life as I call you to and build this boat in this barren land, build this boat, I promise that I will start a new world with you. Again, he says to Elijah that there is a, a new world to come, that there is a place which people will adore and recognize my promise, my hope for them, and that there will be a, a new heart that I will give them, and this is the promise I have for you. He gave the promise to David as he was a shepherd boy by the tree, as he was just playing songs for the sheep. And God says, trust me with your heart and your life, and I will make of you a kingdom that will never end. God continues to pour out his promises throughout scripture. We think of Joseph when he was thrown into this pit by his brothers who had abandoned him and, and sold him to slavery. Even then, God had promised him that he would be the greater of all of his brothers and that at one point he would be called to save his people. And that is exactly what God has done. So throughout scripture, we find God continually fulfilling his promises. We think of how it is not just men, but it is women. It is people who are rich. It is people who are poor. We think of Naomi. We think of Esther. We think of Mary, where God had sold, told to Mary, to you there will be born a child who will be called the Savior of the world. These great promises that God continues to declare for his people. Indeed, these are declarations that God has made of his promise to his people, and that the people who follow God and follow his ways are known as people of the promise. Did you recognize that? That throughout scripture is the people of God's promise who are continually pulled through the scripture. I, it's interesting thinking about this idea of the promise keeping God is that when we look at the New Testament, and the early uh, disciples and the apostles are called to give an account for their preaching of Jesus Christ in the streets, they don't give a good rational explanation for what they're, what they're doing. They don't say, well, here are the three reasons God exists, or here are the four reasons why you should follow Jesus Christ. What they give is sometimes a little bit like, why are you saying this? They start by talking about how God spoke to the uh, patriarchs in the past and how God continued to fulfill his promises. And that is where they start. And you're like, why are they giving so much history? But the whole point of them giving all that history is a declaration to those who are listening that there is indeed a promise-giving God who keeps his promises. And that in this day, through Jesus Christ, there is a new promise for all who believe that they will have eternal life, that they will have hope in God. And so we think about this promise-keeping God as we recognize that God continues to make promises to his people and that these promises have been kept. In fact, if we look at Scripture, there's over 7,500 promises throughout Scripture. 
Now, some of these are promises for the benefit. These are promises. If you do what I ask, then these will be the benefits for you, that your land will increase, that your children will uh, inherit, uh, that there will be a great future for you. Uh, in Jeremiah, he says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for your benefit and for your betterment and not for your destruction. Some of these promises are that if you do not follow God's ways, that there are natural consequences to not following after the Lord, that you will be taken away from your land, that these things will happen to you. But throughout the scripture, that this continues to be God's theme of a promise that he continues to make for his people, promises made and promises kept. And in fact, God not only speaks about promises, but he says that those promises are part of who God is. That God's character is tied to those promises. God is not just a God who makes promises, but God is a God of promise. That God does not just speak those words, but he fulfills them. Now the reality is we know of those hopes and those promises that God has given to them, given to us, is that many of those promises have been fulfilled. We look through scripture, we see how God blessed Abraham, we see how God blessed Israel, we see how God has blessed David. And we wonder, when are the fulfillment of all those promises? There are still promises in the scripture that are yet to come, that haven't yet been fulfilled. And so we live in this middle land between the recognition of the promises that God has fulfilled and the recognition that there are still yet promises to be fulfilled that will ultimately be completed in Jesus Christ. And so we live in this middle ground, which gives us this invitation where do we make sense of these promises that God gives to us? And I first want to encourage us to recognize that God does not just give lip service to God's promises, but that God's promises can be uh, taken for, uh, for real because God does not speak in ways that are just foolishness. If we remember in Genesis when God spoke, and it's given nine different times, and God spoke, and what happened when God spoke in Genesis? It happened, right? God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let there be firmament, and there was land. God said, let there be a sun to uh, to govern the day and moon to govern the night, and boom, God's word was accomplished. In fact, it's described in scripture that God's word does not go out without first accomplishing what is intended to accomplish. God's word is powerful and is able to accomplish its word. One thing I want to share with us, this is from uh, Psalm 33, 6 through 9, and um, I just think it's wonderfully worded, so I'm just going to read it for us. It says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle, and he puts them in the storehouse. Let all the world fear and revere the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. We hear the word there that when God speaks something happens. When God says something, it is real. It is not just you know, like a nice story, but there is some concrete reality, some uh, physical truth to what happens when God speaks. And God speaks his truth and his word so that we might know of his promises. And throughout scripture, as I was talking about, he invites Abraham and others into this promise that God's word as it's spoken, he is inviting us to trust in those promises. And recognize it's not just lip service, but again, that has power to it. And those words of power are called God's covenants. And God continues to make covenants with God's people. And we see in Jesus Christ that he says, yet I will make for you another covenant. And that he shares with his disciples at the great communion table. This new covenant that is made in his own flesh. That's how concrete those promises are, that God did not just put them on paper or even on wrappings, but put it in the very flesh of Jesus Christ. He says, here is my body, here is my blood of the new covenant. The idea is that as we trust in those promises of Christ, that we ourselves will have and receive eternal life. So as we hear about this power of God's word, we recognize that we hear that through scripture. We hear how God the Father spoke those promises, but we also see that power in Jesus Christ. When Jesus was amongst the disciples and they were doing ministry, often Jesus would simply speak the words and someone was healed. Someone would come and maybe they had uh, epilepsy or they needed to have uh, some demon cast out or there was something else going on and Jesus would simply speak the word and they were healed. At one point, there was a centurion that is a Roman officer, and he came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I have a servant who needs to be healed. 
and I would like for you to heal him. And Jesus says, okay, I'll come to your house. And, and the centurion says, Jesus, you don't even have to come to my house. I recognize that I, I lead troops. I lead all kinds of people, and I tell them to do something, and they do it. All you need to do is say the word, and I know it will be accomplished. Jesus looked at the centurion and says, I have not found faith like this in all of Israel, for he has demonstrated what true faith is a lot, was about, was trusting God and his word that when God says it, it will be accomplished. And so the centurion is lifted up as an example of faith, trusting that he himself, that God's word will be accomplished in him. And we see that as Jesus says, your servant is healed. And at that moment, the servant was healed. Jesus simply spoke the words, and indeed, the power of healing happened. In fact, the, the Bible says it this way, God cannot lie. In him there is no darkness. The reality is that while in life we, we might say all kinds of things, and James talks about this, that we might say good words to some and we might speak bad words to others, that out of the same mouth we have this problem, right? We have some things that we say are true and some things we say are false. And he says, how is it possible that out of the same stream of water you might have both fresh water and brackish water, right? Or salty water right, coming out of that. The idea is that God's word is only truth. God's word cannot be a lie. What God speaks is right. And so as we talk about God's promises, we recognize that God's word has power, but also that in the very nature of God, God cannot lie. And God speaks his word of his promise for us so that we might trust in that promise and know that it will not fail. So the first doorway of hope is recognizing not that our hope comes from ourselves, not that somehow I can make myself more hopeful or cheerful today, but recognizing that we can place our trust, our hope, on a fo solid foundation. That is the foundation of God. Do we feel like there is a need for hope today? I don't think I have to say that without laughing because we recognize, of course, we have a need for hope today. Our world is desperately in need of finding some place, some grounding place of hope that is not going to abandon us or leave us forsaken. Even our best scientific efforts to give us hope during this time of COVID are, well, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, something will end. There's an unknown. But God's promises are eternal and secure. And we can recognize that in this secular worldview, it can only be about today or tomorrow until the day in which we die because the world view apart from God, it can only be limited to one lifespan. But we recognize that God, a God of promise, a God of hope, gives us hope not just in the future but also from times past. And we see the eternal perspective, that narrative of hope that takes us throughout the course of history, leading us into the future, into God's hope. So as we place our hope away from just the things of the world, we place our hope in God, we're recognizing that we're resting our hope on something that is much more solid than something that can be as ephemeral as the wind of the day. And we can trust in the God of tomorrow and the God of forever. The God who makes his promises known to those who revere him, who honor his name. The invitation for us is to come to know God, to revere God, and to recognize that God is the one who sets the course of eternity in human hearts. And if we can trust the God of promises, we can't might know of that power of hope for those who believe. Jesus, when he was with the disciples, told this parable. He talked about how there were two people who had an opportunity to build a house. One decided that they would take the easy route. They, they could build their house on the sand. Perhaps their, the materials were easier to come by, by the seashore, but they built their house on the sand. Another recognized it would be a little harder to build their house on the rock but a little farther away from the seashore, but it would take a, long, a little harder time to build and build his house on the rock. And of course, as the storms came, that water rose up and the house that was on the sand got washed away. But the home that was built on the rock stood firm. Jesus tells that parable because he says, now that you've heard the word, now that you've heard the truth, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to place your hope and your truth and your life, your hope on the word, the promise of God as a solid foundation? Or are you going to place your hope on things that do not last? Things that are only going to be here for today, but then been gone for tomorrow. My invitation for us is that we place our hope in the trust and the promise of God. One is that eternal, ones that are not going to be shifting like the sands, but that will be with us for eternity.
There is, requires for us a shifting of our thinking, a shifting of thinking from our troubles and our day-to-day -day struggles to putting our trust in the God of eternity, a God of promises, a God of hope. As it has been said through time that as Christians, our, our journey of life is a journey away from the day-to-day the -day and to live for the future of God, to what he calls us to. In fact, Dwight L. Moody had once said, if you give me those who are feasting on the word of God, they will not speak of their day-to-day -day hunger, but speak of the feasts of the Lord. And I invite us to think about that shift in thinking today as we open this time of hope, the promise that God gives to us, a promise that is not just for the temporary experience, but of eternity that we might abandon the, the upside-down type of experience we have filled with anxiety and worry and stress to say, Lord, even though I'm in the midst of the storms of life, I know that I can stand on the solid promises of your word. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your promise, recognizing that we are not alone or lost or forsaken. But even as we come to this time, we come recognizing that you are the Lord of all time that you know the difficulties of our now, you know the difficulty of each moment, but you give us the opportunity. You open for us this opportunity to know you as the rock of our life. It does feel that the storms of life are raging around us. And God, I pray that you would help us to trust you even to see the glimmer of your hope through the darkness. That even as we begin this Advent season with the lighting of the Advent wreath, Lord, that that light might become a glimmer of your hope, that we might look to you. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite us to stand as we sing the song of response, Great is Thy Faithfulness, hymn number 140.
invite you to be seated. As we continue in our service, we recognize the many ways that God continues to provide his gifts and his uh, blessings in our lives. Even as we've celebrated this great time of thanksgiving together, the bounty that we have enjoyed, we recognize that those are all gifts that God has given to us. And we recognize that this is an opportunity for us to return to God some of those blessings which he has given to us. We recognize that uh, for those of you who are online, that there's an opportunity to provide your giving through uh, the website, uh, through the PayPal, or to send in your offerings through the uh, mailing addresses that are there. And I invite you to make use of those as you would feel led. But let us turn to the Lord as we give thanks for the gifts that he has provided for us. Lord God, we thank you for the many ways you continue to pour out your blessing into our lives. We recognize that those gifts that you have given to us are simply another invitation for us to trust in your goodness and your promise for our lives. And so, Lord, as you invite us to respond with the gifts that you have given to us, with even out of the abundance that we have been given, Lord, that you would use these gifts for the building of your kingdom, that all would know your name and to know of your love. And this we would pray in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand for the doxology together. No, wait, we're going to have special music today. So you're Thank you. 
improvise the stems we sing the doxology together you to be seated. As we come to this time of sharing our joys and concerns, I invite you to mark online if you have any concerns that you would like to share or even joys that you'd like to lift up. I note that uh, I note on Facebook a number of the joys that were shared with family coming together or other events that are happening. Um, I note that I was driving up this morning that we recognize that winter has happened <laughs> or has begun. Uh, we had a good amount of snow that happened last night and it stayed on the ground. So this is officially uh, a snow winter for us as we begin the season. Um, so if you have any other joys or concerns you'd like to share, I invite you to do so now. Any, anyone here have a joy or concern they'd like to share? Something to think about. Yes. Okay. Family together for Thanksgiving. Amen. Beautiful. I celebrate that the Nelsons were here to do the lighting of the candle for us. It's nice to have uh, more persons in, in the pews with us, even if the, we have cardboard cutouts with us this morning as well. And this, I give thanks for God for uh, the creativity of the church and putting those together as well. As we go to the Lord uh, in prayer today, uh, rather than my summarizing the joys and concerns that we have in the past, um, my thought is that we would enter into a time of prayer, that as Joanne would lead us in song, uh, Sweet Hour of Prayer, perhaps, uh, that we would spend some time in prayer, you on your own, just to be in prayer. And uh, as we end, the, end that time together, I would summarize our prayer uh, together as your pastor. And so I invite us to turn to the Lord in prayer uh, together this morning. A time of prayer. Lord God, we thank you that as we come to you, no matter where we are, in our home, on the road, or far away, that we are never far away from you, that your spirit continues to speak to our hearts, helping to assure us of your presence, to remind us of your promises, to remind us that you are present throughout the storms of life. And so, Lord, this morning as we come before you, you know the concerns of our heart, the struggles that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, the need that we have of your strengthening, of your encouragement. We also remember those around us, our family, our community, persons who are in need of your physical healing, those who feel far away from family, who feel far away from their hopes and dreams. And so, Lord, we ask that your spirit would continue your work of speaking into people's hearts, of knowing of your love and abiding presence. And that even this morning, you would fill us with your hope, that we would be your beacons of light, that we might share your word and your truth and your hope that you have given to us, that all might know of your love, 
In this through Jesus Christ who teaches us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have one last song we're going to sing together. We rejoice the Lord is King, uh, hymn 715. We invite you to sing along. As we close our service together, I invite you to look to God in whatever way might be comfortable for you as a way of receiving God's blessing. And Lord, that you would pour out your blessing on all who hear your word. Lord, that we would respond with a yes in our hearts to trusting you with our lives, that we would know of the hope that you have given to us through Jesus Christ. And this we pray in his precious name. Amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.